Uh, yeah, thank you very much for having me. Uh, really appreciate it. Look forward to talking with you all. And, um, and you all have gotten to uh, work with and experience some of the best of Warren Wilson already with Armin and Todd. They're um, outstanding graduate students and they're great representatives of the kind of students we get at Warren Wilson. So um, yeah, so uh, this is going to be a different kind of presentation. And there's going to be no feathery, furry friends. There's uh, no, you know, um, beautiful spring ephemerals. We're, we're going to dig down into the soil. We're going to go past the millipedes and the earthworms and go on down past the springtails and the pseudoscorpions down to microscopic life, which is hidden. We never pay attention to it, yet it's ubiquitous. It's incredibly richly diverse and I hope to convince you gorgeous. Um, so um, uh, so it's, it's a focus on the microscopic, the hidden microscopic world. Um, before I do that though, let me um, uh, point out a few macroscopic friends uh, <clears throat> before we get to the microscopic world. Um, these are students that I've worked with over the years uh, at Warren Wilson College. And um, Warren Wilson is an incredibly special place with incredibly special students. We are, uh, I like to think of us as an experimental college, an experiential college. Uh, we have a working farm. who We just happen to have somebody who works on a farm over here. Uh, and. Uh, She's the assistant farm manager. Um, forest, landscaping, garden, um, those are working landscapes that our students work on. We, we do um, what I think is, uh, is an amazing experiment in higher education, which is try to int fully integrate rigorous academics with on-campus work on farm, forest, et cetera, all the work crews, basically the students run the college, um, and off-campus community engagement, reaching the, the, the mind, the hands, and the hearts of our students. It's an, it's an incredible place. Um, and I've gotten to work with students um, in the sciences. All of our science students, including Armin, um, did, what was your major? Okay, okay. Yeah, and so all of our science students do, um, do a uh, junior, senior level independent research project mentored with one of us, um, and uh, they learn science by doing science. And um, I've gotten to work with now over 40 students over the years, and these have been incredibly eager, bright, hardworking students. And a lot of the research I'm going to tell you about um, has been done with and by these students. Um, all undergraduates. At most universities, you know, it's, there's graduate schools and graduate students doing this work. Th this has all been done with undergraduate students, really talented, hardworking Warren Wilson undergraduate students. And if anybody happens to know people that are of college age and are starting to think about college, grad, you know, grandkids, other people, we have some um, new brochures here about Warren Wilson if you're interested in talking uh, about Warren Wilson. Happy to talk to you about that. Okay, so what I'm going to do is uh, I'm going to do kind of three things today. I'm going to give you a, a brief overview of the biology of these animals and this ecosystem, this microscopic ecosystem. I'm going to talk a little bit about water bears in popular culture because how many of you have heard of water bears? <laughs> you know, so most people would say, what the heck? What's a, well, what's a water bear? But more and more people know about them and they've kind of gotten uh, They've had sort of a, they've become almost a cult, they have sort of a cult following these days uh, for kind of interesting reasons. And so I'll, I'll kind of tell you that little story about their tardigrades in popular culture. Um, and then uh, I'll talk, switch gears and talk about the research that my students and I have done at Warren Wilson for now almost 20 years uh, on, this, on this little known, poorly studied group of animals. Um, all right, so. We're diving down into the soil, or we might be diving down into sediments underwater, uh, or we might be burying ourselves into the lichen on a tree or a rock. In those habitats, if we dive down into the sediment grains, the moist little sediment grains, there's a whole world. There's a whole world of microscopic animals 
Um, there's, of course, a world of bacteria and fungi and single-celled things, but before you get that small, there's this whole complex world of microscopic animals that are multi-celled, complex animals, invertebrate animals, um, and it's a very rich, abundant community. Um, it includes many, 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 many nematodes. Nematodes are the most abundant animals on Earth. Um, and everywhere you look, there are nematodes and little microscopic flatworms and rotifers and mites and a whole bunch of other phyla of animals, an incredibly diverse ecosystem, um, in including, of course, the most important of all tardigrades. Um, and that's just a small sampling of some of the diversity that you would see in any any moist sediment anywhere on Earth. If you went to the grit in your gutter and looked at that microscopically, it would be filled with these kinds of animals. Um, and um, these, this community are sometimes called, they have multiple names, they're sometimes called interstitial animals because they're so small, the sediment grains are their boulders and they're climbing around on the interstitial spaces, the fluid filled spaces between those sediment grains and so these are interstitial animals. They're the little tiny animals that live in the spaces between sediment grains, any place that is either permanently moist or temporarily moist. And I'll come back to that in a little bit. Uh, they're incredibly small. They are, um, they are between 40 microns and 1,000 microns. 1,000 microns is one millimeter, you know, the small mark on a ruler, one millimeter. So uh, these are 40, to, uh, uh, 40 microns to 1,000 microns. A human hair, an average human hair is about 100 microns. So many of these are smaller in length than the width of a human hair. Many of them are unseeable with the naked eye. Um, and the reason that they're defined that way, I have a little show and tell for you here. Um, uh, uh, if anybody l finds out that they love tardigrades like I love tardigrades and you want to learn how to study tardigrades, I'm happy to come back and do a workshop for you. But I brought a little show and tell here. The reason we have that size scale is because, uh, ooh, that was very slick. <laughs> <laughs> um, is the, the, one of the standard ways people study these animals is you would take like a moss sample and you'd put it on this sieve and this is a one millimeter sieve and you'd put the moss sample on there. This is a 40 micron sieve. No animal, no multi-celled animal is smaller than 40 microns so we might get rid of bacteria and fungi and um, uh, Protestans, but we'd keep all the animals. And so we wash the moss in here, catch what's in here, pour this into a petri dish, and that's interstitial animals. Right? So it's, it's kind of, that category is kind of based on just a kind of structural sampling technique. Um, uh, so this, the, these, are, uh, these animals can live in these e e um, temporarily dry and wet habitats because all of them, all, every organism in here, um, have some ability to withstand drying out. And tardigrades are most famous for their ability to stand dry conditions and other environmental extremes. And um, we'll talk more about that in a second. Okay, um, so I want to show you what these animals look like. Um, the way, while we're switching over to the microscope here, let me make sure we have an animal to look at. Oh, it's drying out. Oh, no. We better look fast. Um, so, um, so what we do, the way we study these, there's a couple ways to study them. One is this technique. Uh, a similar technique, like this, this is like for teachers. We've, we've developed this for teachers so that when teachers want to show their kids, um, they can do this. This is uh, a little homemade sieve on a pie plate. And um, this is uh, just a chem wipe, a uh, tissue paper. And this, if you can do this... Um, you can do this at home. You take moss or lichen or whatever it is you want to see, what kind of critters live in it. You sprinkle it on here. You fill it with water so that the base of the moss or lichen is coated, but it's dry and warm up here. And the animals move away from the dryness and the warmth, and they move down, and they can move through the pores of this. And so this separates the animals from the, from the substrate. You pull this off after a day, and in the bottom, there'll just be a little bit of scuzzy stuff. And you can wash that into a Petri dish, like here. And it will be full of those animals that I just showed you. Oh, it's drying out. That, this is an, it's caught in a, a water bubble, and this is air all around it. So this poor little guy, you're watching, you're watching it die, actually. <clears throat> uh, yeah, let's add some water to it. Good idea. 
<laughs> Hang on. You can put a drop on the edge of the cover slip and it shouldn't go through. Oops, went through a little bit too much. I wondered about that. <clears throat> Time out. <laughs> That's better. It's happier now. There we go. Um, so we pour that into a, a petri dish. We see all kinds of animals. And then in order to make a microscope slide, in order to see them, we, we find them with a stereoscope or a dissecting scope. We find the animals we want to see. We can collect them in a number of different ways. We can just use a, a, a glass pipette and suck them up, you know, watch them and suck them up. Um, or we can use a tardigrade lasso. <laughs> this is a tiny little twisted wire with a really, 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 really tiny loop at the end. And um, if we want to transfer a single tardigrade onto a microscope slide to uh, make a permanent mount um, for study purposes or, or um, uh, archival purposes, you, we can flip up the animal into the water column and catch it in the loop and then transfer it into a microscope slide. So um, that's how we study these guys. And so I've made a... Um, I've transferred one onto a microscope slide. This is just in a water uh, uh, wet mount, it's called. And these are pretty temporary because the water evaporates and the brighter the light, the faster it evaporates. So um, this is, um, I have a student doing a research project right now uh, and she's culturing these. Um, and uh, so I got this from her culture. She doesn't know it, so I... <laughs> I hope I didn't mess up anything. Um, but uh, she's looking at how well these animals, this is an aquatic tardigrade, and she's looking at how well these animals uh, survive acid precipitation events. How, how, how well can they handle lower pH levels? Um, so this is a, a tardigrade. We're looking down at it. Uh, the, this is leg one, leg two, leg one, leg two, leg three. The fourth pair of legs sticks out the back of the animal. Um, the legs terminate in claws. In this case, there's two sets of claws on each leg with two branches on each claw. Um, we're looking, it's got eyes right here. Um, the eyes are actually little outgrowths of the brain. Um, and these are the feeding structures. So it's got a mouth, it's got this uh, muscular pharynx for sucking in food. Uh, and it's got a complete digestive system with an anus. And these things are stylets. They're, um, they're stabbing devices that they can poke forward, uh, and they have glands associated, associated with them. We don't know what the glands produce, enzymes, poisons, who knows. Um, but they poke out and grab things, and then they suck them in with this sucking pharynx. Um, so I just wanted to show you a live tardigrade uh, before we go back to our PowerPoint. So that's how, and, and just kind of give you a feel for how we study these things. Um, okay. The reason they're, they're called water bears is because if you're looking in... Um, in, in this community of interstitial animals, there's these wormy things, there's, you know, there's all kinds of um, critters, but these look very mammalian. They can move their heads around, they move kind of lumbering, slow motion, so they look really, really mammalian compared to um, most other little critters in this kind of habitat. And so they are called water bears or uh, moss piglets is another common name for them. Um, so, uh, so let's get back to our PowerPoint, maybe. maybe. Cross our fingers. We might have to unplug it. Let me know if it does what you saw before. I'm gonna have to unplug it here. I always uh, have a little problem with it recognizing. Usually when it sees it, it flashes. There it goes. Are they transparent? Uh, most of them are transparent. Some have some, uh, yeah, so we were looking through that animal. We had the light coming from the bottom, and so all that, all that stuff in here was stuff in the inside of the animal. Um, so, yeah, some of them have some um, pigment uh, on the outside, um, but most of them are pretty transparent. And then that's just a blank slide. Yes, here. so, um, so thank you very much. So that's the, we don't need to change anything again. Uh, so this is what an interstitial community would look like. Uh, this, is, this is a marine interstitial community. And so these are sediment grains, like on a beach. Um, these would be uh, the sand grains on the beach. And here are all these animals 
crawling around in those interstitial spaces. And it is like, it, this is not an unlikely density of these animals. On any moist beach sand you pick up, it is loaded with this stuff. Um, and you see the tardigrades? Four pairs of legs evenly spaced with two of them right here. Those are marine tardigrades. Um, so it's this rich, rich community, but these kind of stand out in terms of their locomotion. Um, so this is an interstitial community, and here's um, what they Here's what they look like when they're crawling around, um, not dried out on a slide like the one I showed you before. So we're again looking microscopically down at the belly of a tardigrade who's crawling upside down like this. Um, and I um, hope oh, that's supposed to be looping. Let's see if I can get that to go again. Watch what happens with these stylets here. These are the stylets that are poking out. You can barely see them up here. So that's these stylets that they can evert. Uh, so tardigrades are in a phylum of animals called tardigrata. The kingdom animalia is divided into about 40 phyla. They're in their own phylum. Anybody know our phylum? What phylum are humans in? Chordata. I heard somebody say chordata. Yeah, we're chordates, not vertebrates. Vertebrates is a subphylum of the phylum chordata. So tardigrades have their own phylum, tardigrata. Tardigrata means slow walker. So their, their phylum name is based on this slow lumbering locomotion. Um, and water bears is also named after that slow lumbering um, locomotion. Um, they have four pairs of little stubby legs that terminate in claws. The, the last pair of legs is switched around backwards like this. And, which is kind of odd, and we don't know how that happened um, evolutionarily, but it's like front pair, second pair, third pair, back pair. And they use that back pair of legs uh, kind of like a prehensile structure. They hold on with those, and then when they want to move, they let go with those and crawl with the first three sets of legs. Um, they, sometimes they have eyes, not always. They have these stylets. Um, and those are the phylum level characteristics of tardigrades. Um, Anatomically, uh, we see the, this is a, a sagittal section, so we're seeing uh, one half of the animal. So four pairs of legs. These, this is this reversed terminal leg. Um, this is this feeding structure, mouth, pharynx, stomach, intestine, and anus. Um, they have a single dorsal gonad, either male or female. Most species have separate sexes, males and females. Um, the single gonad is probably because of the miniaturization that happened evolutionarily. They got shrunk down and they lost a gonad. Um, and uh, they have a, a well-developed nervous system. This is uh, the brain. And if they had eyes, it would be pigmented spots on the brain. Um, and uh, ventral ganglia, which is very common in things like arthropods, insects, things like that. That's the same kind of nervous system. Um, and they have a cuticle. They have an external cuticle made of chitin, just like in insects. And they molt. They, they shed their cuticle as they molt. Um, so these are complex, multi-celled animals. They have about 2,000 cells in their body um, and uh, all these organ systems. They don't have a respiratory system or a circulatory system because they're so tiny, gas exchange just occurs straight across their, um, their surface. Um, so evolutionarily, tardigrades are part of a group of phyla of animals that all have external exoskeletons and they have to molt. So these are the molting animals or the ecdysozoans. Ecdysis is the fancy name for molting. So these are ecdysozoans. Their closest relatives are onychophorans, which are really cool tropical things called velvet worms. They're like they're kind of like caterpillars, that, um, and uh, arthropods, insects, and uh, every, all, all their kin, which is the giant, giant, giant phylum. Um, so they're related to this group, and they all share the same external exoskeleton that has to be molted, and they molt all the same way. These all have a common ancestor. They evolve the same molting mechanism, um, so they're all close relatives. Um, there are about 1,200 known species of tardigrades. Um, and they fill various niches in this uh, little ecosystem. Some are, have these big, robust mouth parts that are really wide like this, um, and those eat other invertebrates. They eat other tardigrades, they eat nematodes, they eat all those little animals that are in their ecosystem. Um, and so these are the predators. Uh, there are herbivores that have small, thin buccal tubes for um, sucking up 
algae mostly, um, uh, or some of these feed on moss tissue, and they use their stylets to pierce the cell, and then they suck in the cell contents. Um, and then some have flexible mouth parts. These are like uh, vacuum cleaner hoses, and they can, they can bend it down, and as they graze along a lawn, a, an algal lawn, they can suck up whatever's down there, and they're probably eating um, a variety of microscopic organisms like fungi and bacteria, <clears throat> etc. So they feed, they, they, they serve a lot of roles. People sometimes ask me, what do tardigrades do in the environment? Well, they do lots of stuff. You know, some of them are carnivores, some of them are herbivores. They do all kinds of stuff. This, what I think of ecologically when I think of this community, as Bab said, is it's the important link in the food chain between the macroscopic world and the truly microscopic world of bacteria and fungi. They're the link, they're the trophic link between single-celled things and big things. Yeah. Oh, you, you mentioned that they had shrunk, that they had been bigger ones. Well, we're, we think they were. The, the, um, there are fossils uh, of tardigrades, like two uh, fossils, and they're the same size. But we, their closest relative appears to be um, uh, a group of things that look like those, those walking worms, the, the velvet worms, the onycophorans. They're a, a group of fossil animals that look like that, and they're, they were about four to six inches long with multiple stubby legs very much like a onycophoran now. Um, and there's pretty good evidence that they, they, that was the ancestor. And so, but of course, yeah, so what we think happened was that that got shrunk down. And we know that happened in some other groups uh, because there's this habitat down there, this interstitial habitat that if you were small enough, you could, you could escape and you could utilize that habitat that nobody else is using. But that's somewhat conjectural. Okay, um, here's a picture of one from our own collection uh, from the Smokies that got caught in the act of eating. This is, this is a macrobiotis with a big, big, uh, strong mouth parts, and it's grabbed a little one called mini-biotis, and it's sucking it down. That's the claw of this one, and it's sucking it down its gullet. Um, okay, um, reproduction. So that's feeding. Reproduction. Um, most tardigrade species have separate sexes, male and female. In some, we've never seen males, and they may have all female populations, or r males might be rare. Um, and so they can, females, in those populations, females can reproduce asexually. They lay eggs, and the eggs are clones, basically. Um, and they produce daughters. Or there's males, and, and um, sexual reproduction can occur. When they lay eggs, most species lay their eggs into their old exoskeleton as they molt. So they molt, lay their eggs, this is the old exoskeleton, and the mother's gone, and the eggs develop in there where they're kind of protected, um, hatch out, and they find their way out. In some other species, they lay their eggs externally, and, they, and these eggs are gorgeous, and they have all these structures that are species-specific, we can use them for identification purposes, um, that are, have structures for latching onto the substrate so they don't get blown away or, or washed away. Um, and so some species lay their eggs externally, some internally. Um, and we actually were culturing some species in the lab and we got some videos of egg hatching. So I'll show you a little video. This is a sprig of moss. This is a poppy seed for size comparison. And here is an exoskeleton with some eggs in it. Okay, so here's a baby that's hatched out already. The mom's gone. He's, she, she is, or he is trying to find a way out. And watch, here's some more eggs. Watch this egg. And then we get to see that in slow motion here. I, I, I added that sound effect. <laughs> uh, and, and so, you know, they keep on going and, and uh, they, they eventually find their way out. There's, there's um, no parental care, there's no uh, external nourishment, it's all the eggs and then the babies are on their, on their own. Um, so, um, so that's egg hatching and uh, we, we won't wait to see them get out. Oops. Um, we do have um, some new information about mating behavior when they mate. And this is kind of cool and weird. Um, this, uh, so, 
we've known all along that, that I mean, for anatomically, we know that, that there's, in species that have separate males and females, that copulation must happen. We know in some species, females store sperm after a mating and then use that stored sperm to fertilize their eggs when they molt. So they kind of wait, they mate between molts use that sperm when they molt to fertilize their eggs. Um, but we rarely seen copulation. And there's only a couple of reports in the literature about copulation. And a German team led by an undergraduate student just a few years ago um, was culturing this species in the lab. Oops, that's supposed to be a video. <gasps> oh no! Let's see. Aww. It's pretty sexy too. Uh, let me see if I can get it to go. Uh, maybe it'll work. Where's my cursor? Oh, here we go. Okay, so this is the female here, and this is the female's body. This is her exoskeleton, so she's kind of pulled away from her exoskeleton, and this is an egg she's deposited inside, and she's going to get, she's gonna break out of her old exoskeleton here in just a little, not in this video, but she will eventually do that. This is a male, and so the male, this is his rear end, and this is his head, and so he's grabbed the female here by the head, and we can actually see in some of these parts of the clip, sperm transfer going on, that's what this is. So that's sperm transfer on the outside of the female, around the head. Somehow that sperm gets to these eggs and fertilizes them and they don't know how. Did it go through the opening in the cuticle that the female made? Did it, she has a gonopore, oops. Uh, she's got a gonopore that it connects to the ovary um, so it could, but the egg's already released out of the ovary, so it's not clear how, how the sperm is being transferred. But they seem to be doing it kind of all wrong, you know, like, like, like grabbing the female from the wrong spot. And so when they saw this, it was like, that's pretty weird. They saw it 30 different times, and it was always the same. So it seems to be the way they do it. Um, uh, we know of some others that do it normally. Um, but, but that's, that's uh, kind of the only one we have a good video and study of. Probably being our one. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, okay, and the final thing, the, the, the final biological thing uh, I want to tell you about is cryptobiosis. So the, I mentioned that for all this interstitial group of animals, the ones that are semi-terrestrial, living in moss or lichen or soil, they can only do that if they have the ability to withstand drying. And so they, they have active periods of life when it's wet, and then they go into an inactive stage when it's dry. And they go that, do that over and over again throughout their lives. Tardigrades are especially good at this. They have amazing abilities to survive in um, environmental degradation. Um, and th when that happens, they go, it, it's this process for tardigrades, there's various processes of um, uh, resistance that different animals use. Tardigrades use a process called cryptobiosis, which literally means hidden life. Um, and what happens is they go from this active stage to this shriveled up little ball. They, they start to dry up, they pull in their claws, they curl up, and that is called a ton. Um, and this is another active, there's several kinds of tardigrades. This is a different one that would be in the active stage and in the ton stage. So this is a ton, all shriveled up, um, and when they're in this stage, they have been shown to be able, uh, there's been tons of experiments where people have put them into cryptobiosis, which is really easy to do, um, and I mean you put them on a, a wet piece of paper in a petri dish and just let them dry at room temperature and they, they do this. Um, and, uh, and then you add water and they <coughs> kind of unfold in about an hour or so. Um, uh, but when, um, oops, when they're in this stage, that, that was the pop culture part, <laughs> when, when they're in this stage, um, they have been shown to survive, oh God, um, close to, as close as to absolute zero as we can get them, 
they've survived. Uh, I've put some immediately in water in an ultra cold eight, minus 80 degree freezer, taken them out months later, pulled them out, and as soon as the water thawed, they were crawling around again. Um, they can withstand, uh, they, withstand they, they can withstand um, incredibly hot temperatures, they can withstand really high pressure and very low pressure, they can withstand UV radiation, they can stand, they withstand pretty much anything we bombard them with, they can withstand in this cryptobiotic state. It's really an inactive, it's really death, it's controlled death, really, reversible death is the way I think of this. Because what happened, and, and this has been studied a lot biochemically, and if anybody wants to talk to me about that, I can tell them about that, that's not my field of study, but we know a lot about the biochemistry of this, and we're learning more all the time, and it's really complex. There are sugars that coat the proteins, there are chaperone proteins that, coat, that, that work with the DNA to keep it from degrading. Um, there's heat shock proteins and oh, just amazing stuff. We're finding out more and more details. And, and there's, the coolest thing is that there's a vitrification process that occurs in some cases in which they basically turn into glass and they become a rigid glass-like structure with all the biological molecules suspended and protected and then that gets reversed. So they're amazingly resistant in, these, in this state. There's no metabolism, no, no metabolism. They, a new paper just came out and um, just this week that showed that, they, uh, uh, that some of these that had been stored for 50 years were viable. 50 years, um, at least. Uh, so incredibly resistant to environmental degradation. And the biochemistry, that's pretty interesting. People are starting to use that and do biomimicry studies. If we could capture some of these techniques for cell preservation, we could use them for all kinds of creative purposes. Like uh, these guys in Japan took a gene from a tardigrade that produced uh, one of these protective proteins during cryptobiosis and they inserted it into some cell tissues and then bombarded it with UV radiation and they showed they doubled their survival to UV radiation. So we could, we could build or work with tissue cultures, et cetera, to help them survive better if we knew these techniques. Um, so people are studying this quite extensively. So here's the transition to pop culture. In the 1980s, late 19, no, 1990s, uh, yeah, 1990s, there was uh, a space mission that sent tardigrades in their cryptobiotic state to space and exposed them to space. And it exposed them to the, to the cosmic radiation, the, temp, the, the um, pressure, uh, the lack of pressure, the vacuum of space, and they survived just as well as the ones back home in the lab survived. When they got back to, to the lab, they put them back in water, they came out normally. They're the only animal known to survive space travel. Um, and because of that, they got pretty famous. That, that kind of launched them to fame, so to speak. <clears throat> uh, and so after this, they, they in, uh, in 2008, they were listed as the top, one of the top 10 things launched into space in 2008 by Wired Magazine. <laughs> and, and, and then, you know, we, people, this, this idea of these, these animals being so, um, such good survivors, they can survive space, kind of was everywhere. It was in the news media. Um, they, uh, they, you know, they, they're now showing up everywhere. This, this is in Asheville. This is, a, I guess, a pretty well-known tattoo place in Asheville. Um, they, um, they are in cartoons. There was a whole South Park episode devoted to them. And it was the first time I ever watched South Park. My son told me I should watch it. That is one crazy show. <laughs> um, they were in the Cos New Cosmos series because of this ability to survive space. It says tardigrades have survived all five mass extinctions. Um, and so uh, they, were, they were in there several times. Uh, they're now, there's, have you watched the new Star Trek series? There's, um, there's a giant tardigrade that's part of their wetware navigation system. I have no idea why. <laughs> so they're kind of everywhere. They're in movies. Um, seen Ant-Man? Uh, I haven't either. <laughs> uh oh, do we not have Sam? We don't have Sam. Oh, we do. See if you can see a tardigrade. It's getting shrunk down. Mm. 
Did you see it? It was a cameo performance. Uh, but it's in the, apparently it's in the new one. There's a new Ant-Man Wasp movie, and it's in the new one, and it's, it's actually a, um, it's a bad guy. It, it attacks him or something. It's sort of mean. It's a mean tardigrade. So that's tardigrade biology and tardigrade pop culture. Uh, they've become famous. They, they've become so well known. When I started studying tardigrades, they were a, a really poorly studied, they're still a poorly studied group, and they're a little known group. Um, now I can't really say they're a little known group. People know about them. One of my colleagues in biology at Warren Wilson, Mark Brenner, was just this semester teaching um, his freshman biology, general biology class, and he asked the students what their favorite animals were. Four freshman students said tardigrades were their favorite animals. <laughs> People wouldn't even have known tardigrades 10 years ago. So they've become kind of famous, but they're still poorly studied. Every three years, there's an international conference to, of all the people that study tardigrades, and it's less than, it's, well, it's now over 100 people. It's about 150 people this year. Uh, so it's a really small group of people that study these things, which is fun, because I know them all. <laughs> they're my colleagues, and we work together. And um, so, so it's really kind of cool. That's all over the world. People doing anything from taxonomy to DNA, crypt, you know, cryptobiotic research to development work, anything. It's just very few people. And one of the reasons is because they're not pests. They're not, they, you know, they, they're not medically relevant. They don't, they're not relevant to humans. And so if they're not relevant to humans, it's hard to get money to study them. Any questions about their biology before we go on? How are we doing time-wise? Still life? Yeah. Um, go ahead. The lifespan. What lifespan. Well, if they're in cryptobiosis, it can be at least 50 years. It, their active lifespan uh, is, they, they go through about five molts in their life, uh, uh, <clears throat> and they can't go beyond that, so they eventually die. Um, in the, we, when we were raising them, the longest lived ones, th these were always submerged in water, I think I got some to live about 200 days. Um, and I think I've seen some live a little bit longer than that. Something like that. So a few months. Um, yeah. And, yeah. Did you have a question? Yeah. I was just wondering, the one you had under the microscope when you said we were watching it die, was it dying or was it going into that time? Um, or what, what caused That's an aquatic tardigrade that always lives in stream sediments. And it, the aquatic tardigrades, marine tardigrades and true aquatic tardigrades are not cryptobiotic. And so they don't have that ability. So it was dying. <laughs> it's in fact pretty dead. And, and the, uh, the, uh, the terrestrial tardigrades, um, the terrestrial tardigrades, if they're not in cryptobiosis, it's pretty easy to kill them. They have to have a slow environmental change to go into cryptobiosis. So if I, if they were in a, in a petri dish um, and the water evaporated quickly, they would die. They have to have a slow transition. That's why we put them on a piece of paper to gradually evaporate. Then they can adapt and go through their cryptobiotic thing. But they die pretty easily when they're out and about. As far as reproduction, how many little ones during their lifetime do they do? Well, that's a really fascinating question. I mean, you saw the picture of the eggs inside the cuticle. So they'll have about three to four adult molts. And the, the largest number of eggs I've seen inside a single cuticle, like in one of the bigger tardigrade species, is about 12. So the maximum fecundity is about 12 times 4. 48, right? That's and that's maximum. The marine ones that I'm now focused on produce one or two eggs per molt. Four or five times, that's their maximum fecundity for their whole life. I don't understand their reproduction at all. I don't understand how they have viable populations. It doesn't make sense to me. And I've talked to a bunch of other tardigrade experts and we're all like, there's a lot we don't know about these guys. Okay, ready to move on? How are we doing? Uh, Time-wise, what are we, are we? Um, so you guys awake enough to go on a little bit more about the next wave? Okay, <clears throat> if you're not awake, you can slap yourself. Or <laughs> slap your partner beside you or something like that. Um, okay, so what I want to do now is talk about some of the research we've done at Warren Wilson um, over the years. And we started working on tardigrades in the year 2000. 
And uh, so it's almost 20 years now of work, but we're not a research university. We're a small college and we are all undergraduates. So I feel pretty proud of what we've gotten done in a 20 year period. And so I want to show you what we've done. It's some pretty, pretty fun stuff. Um, so I got started studying tardigrades um, because of the all taxa biodiversity inventory in the Smokies. How many of you have heard of the all taxa biodiversity inventory? Not very many. That's, um, that's amazing. It's not amazing because we haven't done a very good job of publicizing it. Uh, PBS uh, in uh, North Carolina, PBS. Did they do something? Really? It's about time. I, so this started in 1998. Um, the, the idea of an all taxa biodiversity inventory was started by a really famous ecologist working in uh, Costa Rica. Things went to hell there politically. He brought the idea to the United States and they decided let's do this in the United States. The idea is let's take a big complex area and understand all the biodiversity in that area. What if we could identify everything, all taxa, every living species? And that was the goal of the Autax of Biodiversity Inventory in the Smokies. Let's identify everything in the park. So experts from all over the world came to study their little group. Um, and it's been going on since then, and it's still going on. Um, and, and we took over the study of tardigrades. Nobody had ever studied tardigrades in the whole park. Um, and there's a bunch of groups, a bunch of phyla of animals and other organisms that have never been studied to this day. There's still a lot we don't know in the, in the park, which is the most visited, the most studied national park in our system. There's so much we don't know. Um, and that was the kind of ulterior motive here is to, to teach people how little we know about our own backyard. Um, and uh, so, oh, I don't, oh, maybe I do. No, I don't. So, um, this has been, the ATBI is an incredibly ambitious, in fact, it's an impossible task. It's a Herculean task. Um, and, and one of the reasons it's, it's impossible is because in the United States, we really stopped training very many taxonomists a long time ago. It kind of fell out of favor for various reasons I could go into. Um, and so there's not a lot of people left over. For a lot of these groups, there may be one old guy somewhere in, you know, Bulgaria or something that's a special specialist, and they're not doing any more studies because they're about to die. So, I mean, that's common in, in a lot of these groups. Um, and so this, to get people focused on this and to try to generate interest in young naturalists to kind of say, hey, this is a viable field of study. We need more people that can start learning what we have out there. Um, uh, that's one of the ulterior motives. So this has been a kind of a citizen science thing. The Smokies brings in tons of school groups to do work related to ATBI. Uh, we've had over 200 scientists work there over the years. And since it began, we have almost doubled, there were about, um, there were about 15,000 known species in the park. If you looked at all the lists that they had for the park of everything in the park before this started, there's now been 10,000 in, in just like less than 20 years, there's been 10,000 new records for the park, that is species that had never been seen there before, about 10,000 new records. So we've almost doubled the number of known species in the park and 1,000 and even right now, the species count is 1,000 uh, are new species to science. 1,000 species new to science have been discovered in 20 years in the Smokies, and you don't hear about it in the news. Every once in a while you'll see in the newspaper, you know, some, you know, bizarre frog found in, you know, Scandahoovie or somewhere, and it's, and it's like, oh, it's a big newspaper article. 1,000 species have been discovered next door and we don't even know about it. It's been amazing what, what has happened. And we've had our little share of success here with the tardigrades. So the goal of the Smokies, for every specialist that was working there, for every group that was studied, the first thing we wanted to know is, well, what species are there? And so 10 years of research down the road with probably 20 or 30 undergraduate student research projects, we now have uh, a complete list of the Smokies tardigrades, and it's about 81 species. There were three that were known previously from one study. So 78 of these are new records. Um, and 15 of them are species new to science. Um, we haven't described all those yet. We're still working away. That, that taxonomy and the naming of species is a very slow process. Um, and we've described about half of these in, officially in the literature. Um, so we, we did that. Um, 
And um, here's this, just a few, just a little sort of photo book of some of the species that we've found in the park. This one is really this color. Um, and uh, it's kind of interesting, it was, this is not a new species, but it's a rare species, and we kept looking for it because we knew there were these green tardigrades, and we couldn't find them. And we'd studied, we'd looked at over 600 samples of moss and lichen and soil, never found them, and eventually somebody sent me a bird nest and said, Paul, why don't you look what's in there? There's a bunch of lichen and moss in there, see what's in there. These were loaded in there. And we've since found them in one or two other areas, but they're really, really rare. And they're gorgeous, gorgeous animals, emerald green. This one was kind of a cool story. This one, uh, uh, one of the undergraduate students, Susie Doberton, found this when she was looking at the caves, the lichen on the rocks on the caves around Cades Cove. These are the only place limestone caves exist in the park, so it's an odd, uh, unique habitat. Um, and this species showed up there, and we thought it was a new species and we got started describing it and then we found out that one of my colleagues in Poland had described something that looked very similar and I sent him the specimens and he said, yeah, those, those are just exactly like mine. And his came from China. No other place in between do we know of them. Is it really this big disjunct population or are they genetically distinct? We'll never know because they don't know the original location of the ones from China. We'll never know that answer. Um, here's some of our new species, and, and I'll just show you these. Mostly I point these out just to show that they're kind of all boring looking. Uh, this group of tardigrades all kind of look the same on the outside. The details of their claws and these little structures is how we separate them to species. But we found one new species that is, I think, one of the most beautiful tardigra terrestrial tardigrades in the world, and it's this one. It's the porcupine of the tardigrade world. Um, it's got these giant spines all over it. It's got a smooth little belly and giant spines all over it. There's nothing remotely like this been described. Um, it was a really easy paper to write because it was obvious that it's a new species. Um, this we found in one sample from one moss in um, uh, Purchase Knob. And I've been back there dozens of times recollecting, we, we have four space specimens, and we described it based on four specimens. I've never, ever, ever found it again, and I've tried and tried and tried and tried. Needle in a haystack. <clears throat> Did you all name it? Yeah, we named it. The name? Oh, well, that's, that, uh, naming's fun. Um, and so the genus was known. This is the genus Ramazodius. That was already described, named after an Italian guy from years ago. How do you distinguish mutation species? Distinct species? Yeah. Um, it, the, you, it's all morphological, uh, and so you morphologically compare them and you try to find that your population has unique structures compared to other populations. And if you can demonstrate that, you got it. And you can demonstrate that it's a population. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We don't know about reproductive isolation. We don't know that kind of stuff about them. Um, and more and more people are doing it with DNA uh, fingerprinting as well. The DNA. Yeah, yeah. Um, but the, we named this um, Bellu Bellus, which my brother and I named this. I, I was talking to him, and he, he, he kind of loves Latin. And so we were playing around, and I was just telling him about, I showed him these pictures, and I told him how beautiful these wa were. And so we looked up the name for, uh, this means beautiful beast. Beautiful beast is Bellu Bellus. I'll tell you another story about that later on, uh, about naming. Um, so quickly, um, some other things we did, so we, we, the, the first goal for the ATBI was what species are out here? So we said, okay, here they are, 81 species. And we actually know how complete that is. We think there's about another 10 or so out there someday that somebody might find, but not me. Um, and, um, and so the next thing we wanted to do is make sure that the park and any future ecologists that come there that want to study this group of animals have the tools to do it. And so we created uh, this electronic field guide and uh, identification key. How many of you have used ident dichotomous identification keys to identify things? Anybody ever done that? Um, if you've ever had to identify species, it can be incredibly 
painful and slow and technical. These new keys are computer-based and they're visual and they're intuitive and you basically kind of say, well, I can see this trait and I can see this trait and by process of elimination it pops up which species are there. So we created this easy to use pictorial identification key and the Smokies now has this. So anybody ever wants to study these guys, they have a really good starting point. Um, we've also done a lot of ecology work trying to figure out uh, what I really want to know is what characteristics of the environment in the Smokies dictate biodiversity. Why are some places really rich in tardigrades, some places not rich in tardigrades? And we've um, done some um, modeling of that and we think that these are like, the, the red parts are the biological hot spots for where the greatest diversity of tardigrades are. And what we want to eventually get to is to relate environmental variables to those spots. What is it about those spots that make them really good tardigrade habitats? We don't know the answer to that yet, but that's the kind of thing I'm, I'm kind of interested in. We don't know much about this for things like tardigrades or any other little organisms. Another thing we did that was kind of fun was we asked the question, well, we, we know there's about 1,200 known species. How many total species are there in the world? How many more are there to be found? And we did this really interesting little exercise in biodiversity estimation in which we did that. And I won't bother you with the details on how we did it, although that's really pretty cool if you want to geek out. Um, but uh, what, we found out, what we found out is that we think that there's, a, there's about twice as many out there in the world to be discovered. We're about halfway down the road to discovery after 200 years of research on these guys. Um, and the other thing we discovered is we broke this down into the marine ones. There's only, there's less than 200 known marine species out of those 1,200. Um, about 182 are known, are marine. Um, we think there's a bunch of those to be found and we, we have a very low uh, completeness of the marine tardigrades simply because they haven't been studied much. But they're probably just as diverse as the ones on land, we just haven't studied them much. So, uh, oh, that's the method of how we did that. Um, so, since 2010, I've switched my focus from the Smokies to marine tardigrades. I was a marine biologist at the start, I love coral reefs. And so I kind of merged my two interests now, my knowledge of tardigrades with my interest in marine biology. And since 2010, I've got to sample from all of these places. Last year, I was on sabbatical, and I had a Fulbright to do the first inventory of marine tardigrades in Costa Rica ever. In, in fact, the first inventory of marine tardigrades in Central America ever. Uh, and it was incredibly fun and rewarding and uh, hard work. <laughs> 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 This, uh, this is a, uh, uh, I, I kind of, you know, I don't have a lot of research funding, so when I do a vacation, I collect. And so this is my grandkids and me doing a sail in the British Virgin Islands, and we were collecting marine tardigrades, and they helped me um, do that. Um, so when you collect, here we are collecting under, you know, we dove down, snorkeled, grabbed a bunch of sand, a liter of sand, of just pure white sand. We process it. And pour, it into, and pour the animals into a petri dish, the whole petri dish is covered, totally covered with nematodes and all these little tiny crustacean-y things, amphipods, et cetera, just ton of polychaete worms. It's just loaded with animals, crazy animals, amazing. Um, and somewhere in there are some tiny little tardigrades that are probably about that size that I have to sift through and find and make microscope slides and study them and see what we have. Um, and just here, here's a, a little photo essay of some of the microscopic things we found in marine sediments. You know how marine stuff, like if you go to a creek and you look in, the, in a creek, it's cool, you know, you got rocks and you got insects, but you go to a coral reef and it's like, whoa, same thing happens microscopically. It's like, whoa. So this is a little diatome, that's a, that's a uh, water mite, a marine water mite. Isn't that gorgeous? Uh, that's a preapulid worm, uh, larva. That, uh, this phylum is phylum uh, preapulida, which is named after the Greek god Priapus, which I'll let you guys figure out what that is. <laughs> uh, this is a nematode, even nematodes are beautiful in marine systems, like, th like these. Or that one. That looks like my granddaughter's hair. Um, and what this is, and this is even cooler, this, these red things are um, all 
um, chemosynthetic bacteria, and this is a symbiosis between a nematode and these bacteria that make it hairy looking like this. Uh, and this is a marine tardigrade. We got four pairs of little stubby legs. The back one's reversed. Um, this is this sucking pharynx on the inside. Um, but this one is a beach dwelling marine tardigrade. And it's got, this was actually a North Carolina beach. This was the first one I found. And instead of claws, it's got these little suction cup toe pads. And they are so adhesive, you cannot get them off the bottom of a Petri dish when they're alive. It's amazing how strong, because they live in beach sand and they have to hold on to the sediment grains. Um, these have these long telescopic legs, and these, these are called alley, they're wing-like structures, which we don't really know what they're for. It probably, if they get dispersed and thrown up into the water column, it probably slows their fall. They don't have larvae, they don't have planktonic larvae like most marine animals do. Uh, this one has adhesive paddles. It's kind of fat and it's flat like a little turtle. And this one has th these really long sensory structures are the males and they're, they're probably chemosensory and they probably find females with theirs. They're larger in males than the females. Um, and they have all these support structures for their cuticle that look like horns blaring out. These look like a Dr. Seuss character or something like that. Just amazing, amazing alien looking animals. So um, I just fell in love with the marine uh, interstitial community and especially marine tardigrades. I mean, only 200 species known worldwide, but a whole world of them to be discovered. I mean, yeah, I'll, I'll sign up for that. Uh, and, and so um, I've worked with uh, some European colleagues and we developed the first key to help people identify all the marine tardigrades. And I, um, we got to do all these drawings with the, we have a really nice microscopy lab at the um, college, and we did all these drawings for it. Um, we developed an interactive map. We collected all the literature on every marine tardigrade ever published, and we know now where they're found, and this is an interactive map. You can click on one of these and the species picture pops up. Um, we can find out what species occurs where. We can do all kinds of uh, comparisons. And, um, and uh, um, we can use this database to look at some kind of interesting ecological questions. Like, for example, we were interested in whether or not there are any biogeographical patterns in marine tardigrades. When you think of trees, for example, what biogeographical pattern do you think of as you go from north to the, to the equator? What happens with trees or plants? Get bigger. They don't, they sometimes get bigger. They get more diverse, right? So there's this, there's this well-known biodiversity gradient, latitudinal biodiversity gradient, where things are, most things, not all, are more diverse in the equator than they are at north. So we wondered if those kinds of patterns hold true for microscopic things. We don't know anything about the ecology of microscopic stuff. Um, so I worked with some uh, people to do an analysis and we found out that no, it's a small data set, so we're not positive. It's, it's everything we know, but it's not a big data set. It doesn't look like there's a biodiversity gradient. But my colleague in Italy who was working with me on this said, send me data on their body sizes and let's look at if there's any biogeographical pattern in body size. And we did that. And we found this pattern. This is the latitude, and I'm almost done. Um, this is latitude, this is the equator, this is moving north, this is moving south to the pole, um, and this is body size of the species we occur there. And so as you move north, body size gets larger, 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 larger. There's a famous ecogeographic rule called Bergman's rule, which says that as if you're looking within bears, like the genus of bears, and you go from tropical bears, like sun bears, to northern bears, like polar bears, they get bigger and bigger and bigger. And the reason why is because the larger body sizes have smaller surface area and they can withstand cold temperatures better. They retain heat better. These guys aren't retaining heat they immediately adapt to whatever the temperature is around them. So we have the same pattern of an increase in body size as you go north as we see in mammals and birds, but it's not for the same reason. And nobody's ever seen this before in microscopic animals. They, they follow this biogeographic pattern, but for what reason? So we have a paper out on that, and that's the kind of thing that, uh, that kind of these animals are cool, they, we can learn a lot about them, they have educational value, kids get excited by them, 
And they have a lot of scientific value. They can teach us a lot. And those are the kinds of things that we've been working on. Um, here's a poster of the 25 species new to science that my colleagues and I and my students have all discovered over the years. Um, and that's it. <laughs> So I'm happy to answer any questions if anybody has interest in answering questions. And, and I have a song for you, a charter grade song for you before you go. So, any questions? This is an off the wall question, but do you see a relationship between them and something bigger? In other words, in that microscopic world you've got around you, do they, when you think about them, in, a bigger, a bigger Ecological relationship? Yeah, definitely. Other things graze on these, this interstitial community. Um, we know um, they eat nematodes, and in some, there's a, a couple of papers that suggest that they might control nematode populations. Um, and other things are grazing on that whole community. We don't know anything that's like a tardigrade specialist. Uh, and it's really hard to do any kind of isolation studies where you see what happens when you remove tardigrades. But you can look at what happens with that interstitial community and we know that there are a lot of marine systems there's some marine fish that graze on interstitial organisms um, almost exclusively it's mostly copepods and things like that that make up almost all of their diet but they're eating tardigrades and anything else they get in there so yeah we know that there's a lot of things there, there, there's some trophic webs that have been built based on stream systems and and um, ocean systems we don't know much about the terrestrial ones and that's why just the kind of simple way I think about them is that they're a rung in the ladder between, you know, single cell versus multi cell. That's they're they're in there. And then the second question from, is just curiosity. We have about twenty five creeks that start here on this property. Mm -hmm. So they're coming out of the spring. If we live and collected water close to the springhead of those creeks, would we be likely, or would, as we worked our way down the creek, would we be more likely to see? That would be a really cool comparison. I don't know. Uh, you would definitely find them. They're, they are definitely there. They're everywhere. They, they, they're in, they don't swim. Tardigrades don't swim. They are benthic. So they fall down to the bottom, live in the, in the sediment grains. And so you see them in sediment, and you would see them in the green scuzz on rocks and stuff. Um, and they would be, they're everywhere. The, so you would find them whether or not, I mean, we don't know much about colonization of new habitats or succession in these guys. And so whether or not there's a difference high up versus low down or near the spring versus no, nobody's ever studied that. One of a million questions people haven't studied about these guys. When, when I was at the last international conference this summer, my paper of the 150 papers that were pre presented was the, which was about Bergman's rule, my paper was the only ecology paper presented. There's very few people looking at the ecology of tardigrades. Bob? You were you may have said it in my aged mind and just lost it. Uh, is there a, uh, a medium in which all tardigrades would be okay in? I mean, is, is moisture an okay environment? Most of them, because I was thinking about when you're collecting things that can't tolerate drying out, how do you go through a quick separation of the yeah. Out, so yeah. That you can keep them in a better environment. All tardigrades and all interstitial animals are aquatic. Okay. They they can't survive in dryness because they evaporate just like that. And so the only way they can survive is going into this resting state, this cryptobiotic state. And so, it, it, but that makes it really easy to study things like moss and lichen on trees because you just go out on a dry day, collect the moss and lichen, put it in a paper bag, put it on the shelf. Months later, when you want to study them, you add water, they come out of cryptobiosis, and then we do our processing. <laughs> Will you send them like you showed us at the beginning? Yeah, I have, um, it depends on what I'm doing it for, um, but I can, I, we can put them into, if I'm doing it just for teaching purposes, I'll just put them into something like this and let them kind of self-separate from the sediment. Um, or I can use a sieving method. Uh, we have a centrifuging method. It depends on how quantitative we want to be. How do you get those, where do you get those sieves from? Uh, those, these are really, these are used for soil sediment analysis. 
um, primarily is their, their main purpose, and you can buy sets of these uh, from like forestry supply catalogs and things like that. But people that do leaf litter research, things like that, use these kinds of sieves or different mesh sizes. Um, so yeah, they're, they're, and they're standard sizes so that geologists when, or sedimentologists can kind of come up with like what's the average sediment size in this, in this soil. You mentioned saying something more about the Latin name for Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, so, yeah, so um, one of the new species that we discovered uh, in marine sediments was, um, was a species that my invertebrate zoology class found on, a, on Huntington Beach State Park in South Carolina. So we, in my invertebrate zoo class, we usually do a field trip to Huntington Beach State Park. It's about the closest place we can get to the coast. And anybody been to Huntington Beach? It's a really awesome place because it's got, it's got, rock jetties, it's got, you know, um, mud flats, it's got beach, it's got marsh, it's all, all the ecosystems are right there. Um, so I take my classes there and we do sampling. And so uh, last time I did that, we sampled a bunch of beach sediment to see if there were marine tardigrades and we processed them and we found a species that looked just like a known species, it's really cool, it's got all this armor going all over it, I didn't have a picture of it here. Um, and. Um, it looks just like a, a, another species that's been found up and down the East Coast, except, uh, we don't have a chalkboard, do we? Um, it, it, uh, in these marine tardigrades, the females have these sperm storage structures, and there's two little pores beside their gonopore that then go into a sack. And they, that's where, when mating occurs, the sperm finds its way in there, gets stored in those sacks, and then they use that when they lay their eggs, when they molt. Right? So uh, the sperm storage structures in this one looked extremely different than the known one. And that's very species specific. And there have been several other species that have been named based just on that character alone. We had one specimen. Uh, that one's never been officially named, but my class went crazy playing around with the names. Like, can we get to name this? How does that work? And it was really fun. And the first name they came up for it with it for it was uh, an acronym based on the first initial of everybody's name, you know, some <laughs> wacky, you know, phrase. And, and I said, well, that's interesting. <laughs> and I talked to my taxonomist, not taxonomist friends, and they said, no, no, you don't, you don't do that. You, you know, the, the, there's kind of a hierarchy of, of how you name things. And, and there's like, purists would prefer names to be based on anatomy, some unique anatomical feature, or geography, like, uh, Scurus carolinensis is the gray squirrel. It was discovered in Carolinas. Um, or in honor of somebody. But you don't name it after yourself or some crazy name. Uh, and uh, so I said, we need to name this based on anatomy. What's the unique anatomy? Well, it was that sperm storage structure that was all this, it was like this wrapped up coil is what it looked like. And so one of the students, so we had the naming game and this one student said, that looks like spaghetti. I said, it does. What's the Latin word for spaghetti? Spacellus. So if we ever get to find more specimens and name this, it will be uh, Stygarctus spacellus, which is <laughs> spaghetti. But I only had that one specimen, and, and the reviewer said, yo, you're not quite sure. I mean, this is great. It's well known. I agree it's a new species. But we'd really like to see a few more specimens to know. We couldn't see the whole reproductive structure, so we named it on one specimen, partial description of the reproductive structure, and they said, you know, you need more specimens. I've gone back six times now, and students have gone back six times, and we can't find it again. Which is a problem with these guys, they're rare. So you would like all samples sent to you? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Anytime you go to the beach, send me your sediment samples. My Costa Rica trip was really fun, speaking of sending sediment samples. Um, we sampled beaches and, and subtidal sediments on both sides of the coast, you know, on Caribbean and Pacific, and found 60-something species, dozen or so new species to science, really cool stuff, um, but all shallow water. And my colleague down there, he's like the... Jacques Cousteau of uh, Costa Rica. He's a really well-known scientist down there. Um, and he is, the, he might have already done it. Sometime in October, he was supposed to go down on a deep sea dive in the submersible Alvin from Woods Hole in Costa Rica. And he didn't have any specific thing he needed to do. So he, I said, 
Send me those sediment samples. There's only been a handful of deep sea marine tardigrades described. And so we will now soon get to do a study of the deep sea marine Costa Rica. I said, this is really cool, but it'd be even cooler if I could go down on that thing. That's, that's been like a dream of my whole life. It's like, well, not this time. Yeah. What's the percentage of water beers in those in, with those interstitial animals? Oh, it's, they're, they're not common. So, you know, I mean, it, 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 uh, when I, you know, that, that pl petri dish plate just loaded with animals, nematodes, there are gazillions, polychaete worms, there's gazillions, all kinds of little crustaceans, there's gazillions. In that whole petri dish loaded with that whole mat of animals, I might find 10 individual tardigrades. Beach sediments, beach sediments can have higher populations of those little ones with the suction cups. Sometimes we see hundreds of animals in there, but they're never a high percentage of the interstitial community. And but those tri terrestrial density? Then? In terrestrial habitats, um, it's not as rare. They're not as rare as the marine tardigrades. Um, but nematodes, by far and away, outnumber everything else. Nematodes are hugely abundant animals everywhere. Um, so they're never, they're never a giant percentage. If, if those interstitial animals weren't there, I mean, they're really from your presentation, they're most important, otherwise we have nothing but concrete, right? Yeah. And they're filling out these spaces to keep those yeah, we don't know much about their role in, in um, modifying the sediment habitat, but they do. We know some, there's a few studies that have tried to look at the role of, uh, there's, there's a, a study that came out fairly recently um, that looked at the role of interstitial animals in uh, ecosystem services, providing ecosystem services. And that means all kinds of things. Like yeah, yeah, yeah. And they do some sediment processing in which they break down the sediment. Um, and they do some sediment um, churning so that they are moving nutrients around in the sediment. So they, we don't know much about that, but yeah, I mean, you can't have that many. I mean, you pick up a handful of marine sediment and it is crawling with things you can't see. They gotta be important. We just are ignorant. The thousand new species that you found, that the inventory found in the <laughs> Smokies, what is the breakdown of that? Like, were there any vertebrates? Is it no, vertebrates? there are no, there, there are some new uh, vertebrate records for the park, like a brant, a, a goose, um, that nobody had had a record of that before, but there are no new vertebrates. We knew the vertebrates, and we knew the trees, and we knew the vascular plants really well. And so we found new records, but no new species in those groups. So the first wave of the ATBI was to make sure all those records were complete and to map things. And so they did that with all the known stuff. So almost all of the 15,000 known species in the park are those plus insects. Now insects are, that's you know what, uh, uh, more than half of all named organisms are insects. And so there have been a lot of new insects found, especially micro insects. Um, and that's the majority of those are micro insects. If you want to check out the ATBI, you can look up ATBI. Uh, actually, I think it's discoverlifeinamerica.org. Discoverlifeinamerica.org. And they have uh, a tally sheet that shows all the groups. They show our little tardigrades. Um, and, uh, and so they break it all down. But, but arthropods are the biggest group, for sure. Little tiny insects. Lots of entomologists have worked in the park. Yeah. Go ahead. Oh, you, you said in your presentation this estimate of how many there are yet to be discovered. How on earth can you even ask? <laughs> <laughs> That's really fun. It's a cool mathematical thing, though. So maybe I should talk to you afterwards. <laughs> um, but it's really, really cool. And I, I would need a whiteboard to show you. But I'll show you. It's, it's really awesome. And it's controversial. And so somebody asked if, if that my, my estimate is really doing science, because in science it should be repeatable and predictable. And I said, yeah, it's just going to be like a 200-year experiment. You know, we won't know <laughs> how close I am to being right for a long time. Yeah. Do you find the difference of the water photographs between freshwater and Oh yeah, totally, totally different communities. I mean, as far as 
Well, I mean, as far as abundance and percentage yeah. size. You know, I've never really done that. A, a freshwater tardigrades are never super abundant either, but you don't have this massively rich, you know, huge populations of other organisms either. So it's a, it's a more depauperate community in general. So my guess is the percentage is higher. Um, just because it's nothing like the richness and the complexity of the marine ecosystems. Which is why I love marine ecosystems. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right, you got a song. I got a song for you. Okay, so this, uh, so let me give you a, a little background on this song. Um, this song is by this crazy guy named Mal Webb, who's an Australian guy, and he makes all his songs by mouth sounds. So every sound you're going to hear is his mouth sounds. Uh, and he mo mostly just makes really wacky, crazy, funny songs. And which is what this is also. And for some reason, he found out about tardigrades and made a song about tardigrades. Um, and this is pretty old, and so it's very, uh, and, and somebody put a, a video to it, and I have that so you can hear the words, but see the words, because it has the words written out. But it's very dated politically. It's back in the George Bush era, and it's very slanted politically, <clears throat> so I'll just give you that warning. Um, but I have it there so you can see the words of the song. Okay. okay. Maybe it'll work. Oh, hang on, hang on, hang on. Stop. I'm going to turn up my sound. Sorry about that. Then I become Peter Will in a vacuum bottle frozen centuries of happy. Do you? Let's do it. It's worth it. So give me, give me just. Yeah, I could post it online. Yeah. Well, you could probably find it if you said Malweb Water Bear song. You'd find it. But I want you to be able to see those words too, so. Oops. Okay, so it should, it'll pop up here in a second. Yeah, there's our stupid little thing. Oh, and you'll need to plug that into. You want to take that in and it goes into a speaker here. This goes into, oh, it goes into this speaker? I think so. Yeah, right. There. This is worth it. I tell you, it's really worth it. <laughs> we're, we're, we're excited. And then I need this thing. <clears throat> this would go into your computer. Yeah. Oh, no, I have one of those. Okay. Everything else is gone, but it still has that. Yeah. <laughs> it's very... We're very close. Sorry, this isn't too slick, but we're there, almost. This thing's so frustrating. There. That flash mm -hmm. should... Mm-hmm. Don't touch it. Okay, here we go. This will be, hopefully that will work. Is it not working? <laughs> well, we'll just do it out here. That's fine. At least we can see it. Thank <laughs> you. 
bring your head down. You must have shared with your own water there. That's it. <laughs> Sorry about that. Thank you all for coming.